Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Infrastructure Bash. So uh, we've got three excellent talks for you this lunchtime, but as ever, a few announcements before we start in. So uh, this will be the final bash before we take a break over the summer. We've had a very good run so far this year, but our momentum is flagging a bit and we need a break. So as Bono memorably put it, we, uh, we have to go away and dream it all up again. And uh, in particular, we need to go out and find some more speakers. Uh, so in that regard, we put together a short survey uh, to find out what you like best about Bash and what you would like to see us doing going forward. So um, Zara will put it in the comments uh, and tweet it out after the event. So uh, if you could fill that in for us, we would be uh, very, very grateful. Uh, as ever, if you'd like to speak at Bash or volunteer a colleague yeah uh we would love to hear from you and uh, especially we're very very keen to help first-time speakers get started and we can offer all kinds of assistance with preparing your talk and rehearsals and so on so uh please do get in touch uh, that's pretty much it, uh, except to say that whilst I personally uh, am in no hurry to get back to the daily grind of planes, trains and automobiles, if I had our first speaker's address, I would happily commute 100 miles every day on a unicycle through a hurricane whilst listening to death metal. So uh, I will leave it up to him to explain why. So uh, if uh, if I could invite, invite Ryan to the, sorry, if I can ask Ryan to invite Michael to the stage even. Here we are. And the, the floor is yours. Yep. Thanks very much for the introduction, Gareth, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, good afternoon from sunny Geneva. So I will be speaking on uh, data storage for big science in the exascale era. So I'm speaking to you from, from CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. And well, I'll talk about a bit more than just data storage. I'll talk about computing in general, but uh, I'm working in the storage group. So that's my speciality. So I'll focus on that a little bit. So I thought <clears throat> I'd start off with uh, a photo. This is just uh, outside my office. It's about 100 meters from my office. I took this photo a few days ago of the antimatter factory at CERN, which is the coolest place in the world. And I'll, I'll talk about why that is in just a moment. But uh, CERN has been in, in a maintenance mode since 2019, or as we call it, long shutdown two. And it's now just beginning to wake up. The accelerators have been upgraded, the detectors have been upgraded, and we're beginning to switch all the machines back on again. So the antimatter, fa antimatter factory is one of the first machines to restart. So on 28th of June, just a few days ago, they took their first proton beam, and this beam hits a fixed target. It's a sheet of iridium in a graphite matrix enclosed in a titanium alloy shell which uh, produces a spray of particles which are caught in a magnetic horn, which is cooled and trapped. And that's how you make antimatter. But uh, another reason to, to show this, this photo is that, well, it really does look like a factory. <clears throat> All of CERN's uh, publicity photos, you know, if you, if you look at the, if you look up antimatter, fa antimatter factory on the, on the web, you'll see a photo of some gleaming machine in an underground chamber. But uh, on the surface, it's it's really just a box, and uh, it's maybe a reminder that uh, CERN is it it's an industrial facility, and you can think of CERN as a kind of factory. Um, the product that that we produce is not antimatter, because the antimatter is produced, it's analysed, we collect some data from it, and and then it disappears, and uh, that's the case with all of CERN's experiments. Our product is data. The, the particles disappear and uh, we, we, we keep the data forever. And uh, ultimately, this data becomes knowledge about, about our universe and how it works. So, um, of course, the top question on your mind is, can you make an antimatter bomb? So if, uh, if you like Dan Brown and you've read Angels and Demons or you've seen the movie, um, you'll know that uh, the Illuminati come to CERN and uh, steal some antimatter and use it to make a bomb and then threaten to, uh, to blow up Rome. And uh, Tom, Tom Hanks has to run around trying to find them. But uh, so is, it, is this a feasible thing? Well, kind of, yes and no. So if you wanted to make a 20 kiloton um, a bomb, a bomb with the explosive capacity of, of 20 kilotons, you would need about half a gram of antimatter. And this half gram of antimatter, if you allowed it to interact with normal matter, the anti antiparticles and particles would destroy each other and, and release enough energy to create a very big explosion. However, at CERN's current rate of production of antimatter, it would take about 2 million years to make that much antimatter. So. There, there's really not much danger of the antimatter bomb. But if you'd like to know more about this, there, CERN has an Angels and Demons FAQ. Uh, so, 
CERN, CERN has a very large, wide and diverse experimental program and antimatter experiments are, are part of the program. So these, these five experiments will, will be starting up in, in the next days and beginning to, to take data. Um, beyond antimatter, we have uh, what are called fixed target experiments. This is like I described for the antimatter factor where a proton beam hits a, a sheet of something and produces particles which then pass through a detector. Um, so I'll just comment on one of them there, NA62, they're searching for a very rare form of k on decay. So they fire their beam at a beryllium target and uh, it creates particles which go down a detector, which is I think 100 meters long. And uh, this, this decay is so rare that they, in one year of data taking, they expect to observe this event occurring once. But uh, in, their, in their last year of data taking, when they analyzed the, the data, they found two events. So they were very happy. It was very successful. Um, we have other experiments, cosmic ray experiments. We have some on the ground at the CERN facility. And we also have a detector on the International Space Station, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Um, so this uh, takes very precise measurements of cosmic rays from outside of the Earth's atmosphere and uh, is also used to search for antimatter, dark matter and missing matter. But of course, CERN's flagship experiments and the ones which you're most likely to have heard of are the four experiments on the Large Hadron Collider, ALICE, ATLAS, CMS and LHCB. <laughs> And uh, Atlas and CMS are particularly famous for the discovery of the, the Higgs boson a few years ago, um, verifying the, the, the theory of Peter Higgs from, um, from the 1970s. Um, now, the names of uh, facilities at CERN are um, sometimes they're a bit science fiction, like antimatter factory or super proton synchrotron. But uh, Often physicists are quite boring in their choice of names. They choose names which are quite literal and prosaic. And, and Large Hadron Collider is, is a case in point because uh, it does what it says on the tin. It, it is large. Uh, it's, in fact, the world's largest machine. It lives in a tunnel 27 kilometers long, which uh, passes underneath Switzerland and France. And, and it collides hadrons, which hadrons, uh, if you did GCSE physics, you probably know them better as protons and neutrons. Uh, a hadron is a, a particle con consisting of uh, two up quarks and a down quark bound together with a strong force. And uh, for most of the year, we collide protons. So we fired two proton beams and in opposite directions around this ring. And uh, the, the, the protons collide within the detectors for which we collect the data. Uh, and for about one month in the year, we collide heavy ions. So uh, up, up until now, it's been lead ions. And uh, in the future run, we're going to be colliding oxygen ions. So what's all the technology that makes this thing work? Well, there are many, many, many technologies for this uh, um, immense and complex machine. Um, vacuum, cryogenics, injectors, accelerating cavities, transfer lines, collimators, beam loss monitors focusing magnets, bending magnets, and, and that's what's in the photo here. This is one of the, the dipole magnets from the LHC. It weighs about 35 tons, costs half a million Swiss francs. There's about a thousand of these in the tunnel. Um, because if you fire a proton beam, it goes in a straight line. If you want it to go in a circle, you have to bend it with a magnetic field. So because the particles are traveling at close to the speed of light, the magnets have to have an extremely strong field of 8.4 Tesla. And to create this field, we need a, an extremely high current of 11 kiloamps. So if you put an 11 kiloamp current through normal cables, they, they would probably melt. So uh, we have to use superconducting cables. So this is made from a special niobium titanium alloy, and it has to be super cooled to 1.9 Kelvin, uh, and then it has zero resistance, and, and we can supply the current to these magnets to make the machine work. Um, so just on that point, um, the superconducting cables in the LHC are 1.9 Kelvin. I'll just put this beside a photo of Kelvin from outside the Ulster Museum to give a Belfast link there. But Kel zero degrees Kelvin is, of course, absolute zero, zero energy, zero, zero temperature. So 1.9 Kelvin is um, very, very cold. But the antiproton trap in the antimatter factory has a temperature of 1.4 degrees Kelvin, so almost, almost zero. And uh, this means the antimatter factory is cooler than the LHC and therefore the cooler, coolest place in the world, quite literally. Um, 
It's in fact cooler than interstellar space. It's uh, it's the coolest place in the solar system. So, what do we do when we um, when when we fire these two proton beams, one clockwise, one anti-clockwise? Well, we do what the Ghostbusters knew that you should never do. We cross the beams, and that's where the collisions happen. Um, so, inside the detector, um, if you want to get a little bit technical, we have a the beam luminosity times the cross section gives us the number of collisions that we expect, and uh, the beam luminosity is, is uh, basically a, fu a function of the energy of the beam, the number of protons in the uh, in each bunch. So when we cross a bunch of pro protons going clockwise with a bunch of bunch of protons going anti-clockwise inside the detectors, we expect uh, 19 inelastic events. An inelastic event is where two protons hit each other, destroy each other, release um, free quarks, which then rebind into other particles and pass through the detectors. So those are the things the physicists are interested in studying. Um, the proton bunches are separated by a gap of 25 nanoseconds. So uh, because the bunch has a length as well, that, that gives us a, a crossing rate of 31.6 megahertz. Um, so if you multiply those two things, one one packet every thirty one every twenty five nanoseconds, or thirty one point six million packets per second, times those nineteen average uh, collisions per per event, that gives us our our event rate of six hundred million collisions per second. So this is what happens inside the detector. We get these six hundred million collisions um, spraying their their particles through the detector. Um, However, most of these are not of interest because most of the, the, the processes which take place are well understood background processes and physicists aren't interested in understanding the, in, in studying those things which they already understand well. What they're interested in is the rare events. So about one million, uh, one, one event in every million is of, of interest to the physicists for their, for their study. Um, so we have to get down from a million events to one event. Um, this. There, there's a cascade of uh, through through the trigger the trigger system in the data acquisition system which um, does the selection for us. So the first part of the data acquisition system is usually um, FPGAs. So it's it's selecting one event out of ten thousand, just making a very very quick determination and then passing on events that look like they might be interesting and keeping the ones which are definitely not interesting and just losing those. Um, this goes at a, a hundred gigabit gigabytes per second, I should say, uh, to a server farm, and uh, there we have fifteen thousand processor cores, which selects one out of the hundred of the, of the remaining events, and uh, then this then produces the data which we're going to store and and study. So the four detectors there for the um, the four experiments, they they will all send data to the CERN data center at this point after having made this pre-selection. The numbers there are from CERN, CERN's LHC Run 2, which uh, finished in 2019. And uh, there's going to be a significant upgrade for Run 3, which will start next year. So the detectors will be sending the data at a rate of 5 to 10 gigabytes per second to the data center. Um, so at the data center, uh, again, this number is a bit out of date. We've got 95, no. I th no, a few, I think 250,000 odd cores now. Um, so th this is where we aggregate the data and, and then we, we do two things. Initial data reconstruction is where we, well, we want to know which events, which uh, things that we detected belong to the same collision event. So if you imagine one, one collision will create lots of particles which go through different detectors. Some of them go in a straight line. Some of them are, are bent by a magnetic field. Um, so we detect multiple different things. And then we want to, we want to trace those back to, to the same collision. So this is, this is the data reconstruction phase to kind of connect the different events together. And at the same time, we keep the long-term storage of the uh, of the raw data. So this is copied to, to magnetic tape in our robotic tape libraries. Um, after that, then the data has to be distributed to the places where it'll be analyzed and studies, studied. So we call um, CERN, uh, the CERN data center where I'm standing now is what we call tier zero. And uh, from there we distribute um, over uh, a, a private optical network to tier one 
which are national computing centers. So uh, I think it's now 13 national computing centers around the world in certain member states where, where they'll take a, a portion of the data. So we'll distribute all of the data, although not, not all computing centers get a copy of everything. They'll, they'll get a, a portion of it. Um, then the tier one centers, they distribute it to their tier twos. So this would typically be uh, universities or other research institutes. And uh, the, the tier two is just distributed to, to tier threes, which could be individual computers or um, um, to individual researchers. So the computing facilities uh, that we have at CERN, this is, this is kind of the, the headline front, front page numbers. So yeah, we have 373,000 uh, computing cores, 95,000 disks, uh, 92 tape drives. And uh, just to break those numbers down a bit, um, so our disks are 85% hard disks, 15% uh, SDDs. Uh, nominally, we have a capacity of 485 petabytes. Uh, at the moment, we have 135 peta stored on disk, but uh, because of redundancy, um, RAID and uh, other, other forms of redundancy, that's, that takes, occupies about 270 peta of, of space. So, okay, we've still got a bit of capacity there. But um, on, the, on the tape side, which we use for storing the, the raw data and the long-term archival of the data, um, we've got 32, just over 32,000 cartridges, which is storing 380 petabytes. And the, the rate at which this data is written is increasing exponentially. So the last year of data taking, the, la, the, la, uh, the end of LHC run two was 2018. And in that year alone, we wrote 115 peta. So that was one third of the total. And data retrievals are already exceeding one, one exabyte per year. Um, so if we look at what's, what's stored on tape, you can, you can kind of see this uh, exponential growth. If you look at uh, 20, 2014 was where uh, run two started going up to 2018. So there's this exponential growth. Um, after that, it, it flattened off a, a little bit, but then it's going to start growing again when, when we switch on the machines. Um, so our predicted storage needs are, well, we're, we're less than half an exabyte at the moment, but uh, some way into the next run, we'll, we'll exceed an exabyte within the next few years. And then as we get into to run four, uh, 10 years from now, we, we predict that this will increase to around four exabytes. Um, now, this is something of a problem for the physicists because uh, physicists always want ever bigger and more powerful machines. And then that means they always need ever bigger and more powerful computers to, to process the data from these machines. Um, so you can see there on, on these two charts, um, run two, run three, run four. So run, run two is, is the one we've just done. Run three is going to start next year. The blue dots are the, um, their predicted resource needs. So on the left-hand side, it's uh, CPU. On the right-hand side, it's storage. And the black line is the budget. So you can see for run three, it more or less looks okay. The, the blue dots and the black line are, are more or less in the same place. But when it comes to run four, the high luminosity LHC from um, the later part of this decade, um, the, the predicted amount of data and the predicted amount of compute is way, way above what, what the budget is, has provided for. Um, so this is the, always the challenge at CERN, fit physicists' ideas into computing resources. So how, how can we do that? Well, the budget's currently increasing at 15% a year. So we could increase the budget by more. And for sure, the physicists are going to ask for, for more money. And they'll probably get some more money, but it's not going to increase by this exponential amount that they're asking for. So uh, a second possibility is that we don't keep all of the raw data. In the end, the, the analysis is done on the reprocessed data, not on the raw data. But you want to keep the raw data around for the purpose of um, being able to um, to verify that you calculated the reprocessed data correctly. and if there's some some error in your in your algorithm or your software which uh, is re reprocessing the data, you might need to go back and do it again. So you don't want to lose the raw data. So this is a very controversial idea, getting rid of the raw data. Nonetheless, um, some of the experiments are talking about this, where they'll keep a portion of the raw data, but maybe not all of it, and keep all of the reprocessed data. So um, controversial idea, but, but really the the storage needs are 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 driving this. 
another possibility is to make better use of cheaper storage. Um, so one of the ideas is uh, uh, called tape carousel, where all of the reprocessed data is not available on disk because there's not enough disk space. So it all goes onto tape, and then it's brought back onto disk in in chunks, uh, a bit of a bit at a time. So like a, like a carousel, you you're you're bringing it a bit at a time, and then deleting all of that, bringing in the next bit, and the physicists are just told, okay. Now, now you can delete this part. Now you can do your analysis on on this chunk, and the other bit you want to see won't be here until next month, whatever. So, um, these kind of ideas are being looked at. And uh, a question we often get is, well, why don't you just use the cloud? So um, I'll talk a bit about that. But uh, in order to give uh, some background to the answer to this question, I'll I'll talk something about uh, CERN's CERN's history in computing. Um, because I think you need that to, to really understand the context of um, the, the solutions that we've come up with and, and why we think the, the way that we do. So commercial data centers are a relatively recent phenomenon, but uh, CERN has been doing computing since 1957. Um, this is a photo of CERN's first mainframe, the vacuum tube for anti-mercury. Um, in those days, American companies didn't yet dominate the market, so you could buy an Italian uh, mainframe computer. Uh, it was assembled in two days, and it was cutting-edge technology, 16.6 kilohertz processor, 85 kilo, kilobytes of storage. Uh, it predated the, pro the Fortran programming language by two years. Uh, it had its own programming language called AutoCode. It cost a million Swiss francs. Its serial number was number six out of 12 that were made. And um, so, so the physicists got this computer, and uh, a a couple of years on, in the 1959 CERN annual report, it said this, as needs increase, it will be necessary to envisage the replacement of the mercury by a more powerful system. So this is always, this is always the story in computing at CERN. You know, they, they had the best, most powerful machine that was available at the time, but OK, we need a more powerful one. Um, so fast forwarding a bit to the, to the 1970s, this is the era of proprietary solutions. So there were there were no LANs, there were no PCs, there was no Unix, there was no C, um, and CERN was kind of developing its own solutions. So uh, there was a network on the site called CERNnet, uh, a predecessor of the internet, which connected the data acquisition systems to the central computing systems. But uh, of course, all of this lack of standardization was something of a problem. So by the 1980s, there was the idea of adopting standard protocols. So the CERN communications group was set up in 1983, uh, focusing on the CERN-wide network backbone and stressing the uh, the ISO networking model. I don't know if you know anything about that. I studied that at university and then never heard of it ever again until I came to CERN. And and this, this was apparently what, what CERN communications was based on in the 1980s. But in, um, in 1984, there was a pilot project set up to evaluate the use of TCP IP to give a common networking protocol. And this was adopted in 1985. It was chosen as the control protocol for the accelerator of the day, the LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider. And then this created the environment by the end of the 1980s where CERN was using standard protocols. Everything was on TCP IP, everything was networked. CERN was connected to other institutes around the world via the internet. And this, this really created the context into which the, the World Wide Web, the invention of the World Wide Web was possible. So of course, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, working at CERN, invented this as, as a, a system for physicists to, to exchange data. Um, uh, you may have seen that Tim Berners-Lee was in, was in the news recently um, because he's auctioned the, uh, the original source code of the World Wide Web as, as a non-fungible token. And uh, I, th I think I saw yesterday it sold for $5.4 million. So this is something controversial because although Tim Berners-Lee did indeed author the software, he's not the copyright owner. Um, and uh, there's, there's a copy of the CERN document which shows that the, all of the World Wide Web software, the client, the server, and the W3 library was put into the public domain on the 3rd of May, 1993. So, if you would like to make your own non-fungible token of the uh, World Wide Web code, just contact me. I'll be very happy to send you the source code and break a leg. So um, in the early 1990s, 
CERN was at the center, center of the largest internet hub in, in Europe. The, uh, the CERN Internet Exchange Point, the CIXP, which is still in use today, was uh, the, the biggest internet switch in Europe. And uh, you can see there from the diagram connecting to uh, research institutes in, in a number of cities uh, around Europe and, and further afield. Um, so this, this then connectivity of CERN gave rise to grid computing, which is still the dominant model for, for how we're doing uh, compute and, and storage at CERN. So we moved away from mainframes. We started using distributed risk Unix systems, and uh, we had our own software, uh, Shift, which was a storage system, which for the first time connected multiple uh, independent tape disk and, and CPU servers using, using standard protocols. Um, so by the 2000s, the, the, the grid had, a, had evolved into this structure, which is more or less the structure we have today. Um, with tier zero, so as you can see, it's a hierarchical structure. So tier zero uh, is the CERN data center with 13, 13 tier ones, the national computing centers, which are all large enough to, to store a share of the LHC data connected by the LHC optical private network, a 10, 10 gigabit uh, private network. Uh, we have 155 tier twos, universities and scientific institutes which, with sufficient compute and storage for, for data analysis. And uh, then tier threes, as I mentioned earlier, are individual scientists using local computing resources. It could be a university department or, or even an individual PC. So um, now, of course, cloud computing has become um, the, the dominant computing model within the last 10 years, 10 or 15 years. And, um, uh, the CERN Tier Zero data center is beginning to look like any other commercial data center. Um, you know, it's rack, rack mounted servers and virtualization. Ninety percent of the computing resources are provided through an OpenStack private cloud. Um, so th then we begin to think, well, what about commercial cloud offerings? Is, is that something that CERN could use? And uh, the issue here is that that CERN's computing needs are are not uniform. So during during times of data taking, you need you need a lot more computer, computing and storage. And uh, during um, maintenance periods, as as we are now, then then the needs are much less. So the the needs are not constant. So we have our own uh, facilities, our own um, compute, our own storage. But then during the run, we need we need additional compute and storage. So this gave rise to the idea of opportunistic compute. We want to be able to add additional computing power on demand, on demand to provide elasticity. And this, this has led to the idea of hybrid cloud computing. So it's CERN native OpenStack cloud, always available, plus opportunistic compute from commercial, cyber, commercial cloud service providers. Um, so this project was called Helix Nebula. Um, and uh, the, this went out to tender. Uh, we asked some cloud service providers to create custom solutions to host CERN applications with CERN federated identity and single sign-on in a way. So this would be cost efficient for CERN because we only have to pay for what we actually use. But then the platform itself could also be repurposed by other research institutions. So when CERN doesn't need it, then other research institutions could use the same, the same facilities. Um, so this, this went through a procurement process from, from 2016 onwards until uh, the final implementation in 2019. Um, so it, it, I think they started with four, four pro providers who made it through the first stage to down to two providers to, to the pilot, and then finally one, one who's done the implementation. Um, so the, the Helix Nebula Science Cloud is infrastructure as a service. Um, it's offering compute and storage, virtual machines and containers for data sets up to petabyte scale. Um, now the, the federated identity management was, a, was an extremely important component of this because the physicists don't want to care whether their programs are running on CERN facilities or on, on a cloud service. So we had to provide them with one common API um, one and one common federated identity. So they, they can authenticate at CERN and then they can use the facilities anywhere. Um, however, uh, as even the cloud service providers themselves noted, there are certain limiting factors when when using cloud for um, 
for, for certain activities. Uh, bandwidth is, is a limited activity. So of course, on our own facilities, we have these dedicated private optical networks, but uh, those those same private connections to commercial centers don't necessarily exist. So there's there are some um, limiting factors, which mean some activities can only ever be done on site at CERN, but the, the activities which don't require, don't have some such stringent bandwidth needs can be done in commercial facilities. Um, now, Helix Nebula works very well for, for compute, but uh, archival storage is, is maybe a, a different problem. Um, the issue here with, with the physics data that we store is that it's never deleted. We keep it forever. Um, so the archival storage system contains data going back to the experiments from the Large Electron Positron Collider in the 1990s, um, or even further. And looking forward, the LHC project is planned to run until 2037, and we've already started planning for the successor to that. So, you know, we're, we're looking at a project that spans 50 years or 100 years. Um, so the, da the data needs are just going to grow, and we need to plan on long-term timescales. The other uh, thing to note is that, you know, this data that we store on, on tape or in archival storage is not backups. It's the custodial copy of the data. In, in many cases, it's the only copy of the data. So um, the data can be retrieved and is retrieved very, in a very active way. It's not, like a, it's not like a backup workflow where you're putting data in all the time and you only take the data out if, if something goes badly wrong. The, the active archive means you're always putting it in, you're always taking it out. Um, so quite, quite different to, to some of the, the cloud offerings or the, the pricing of the cloud offerings, let's say. Um, so I think when CERN looks at uh, commercial cloud storage, you know, if you look at Amazon Glacier or something like this, we, um, we see it as a bit of a lobster pot. You know, it's very easy and cheap to put your data in, but once you're in, it's not so easy to find your way out again. So for this reason, um, CERN is ex extremely cautious about the idea of putting any uh, archival data into, into commercial providers. Um, we've been burned a few times by license conditions changing and, and um, uh, commercial contracts. So um, for, for the time for the time being, at least for the foreseeable future, all archival storage is done at CERN on, on CERN facilities using CERN software. And uh, our, our CERN software suite for storage is, is this. Um, we have EOS Open Storage, which is the, the physics for disk. Disk for Physics, um, the CERN tape archive, which is the, the archival storage to tape, and the file transfer system, which is a, a, a data movement system, which allows us to, to shift data with, within CERN and, and across the world. Um, but of course, we're looking forward. You know, this is, as I said, this is a, a long-term project, so we're thinking about the future. Um, the computing needs for run three, which as I said, starts next year, will be double those for run two. And then when we go to run four at the end of the decade, it'll be double again. Our current computing center is, is an aging building. And one of the limits is, is the power supply to the building. We've, we've no way to deliver more power. So we have 2.9 megawatts and um, we, we can't increase it. So that limits the amount of cooling you can do. And it means we've, we basically can't add more computers there. Um, so it's just been approved that we'll build a new computing center. Construction will start this year and should be in operation, sorry, next year, and then op in operation in 2023. This will start with uh, four megawatts, so it'll increase our capacity considerably, and it itself will be upgradable in the future to eight and then to 12 megawatts. And this computing center has a very um, high power usage of Hectomus in the design. So no office space in the building, uh, very efficient cooling and then energy recovery from, from the cooling systems to, to heat office buildings. Um, so this gives the, the picture of the, uh, the CERN facilities at the moment um, and how it's going to be for run three. So you can see the LHC on the bottom right there, bottom left, sorry. Um, uh, and the, the upgrade of, of the network. So you've got 200 gigabit uh, connections coming from LHCB and Atlas. Uh, Alice have even upgraded much more than that. They have a 1200 gigabit connection. Uh, all of that's coming to our tier zero data center and in future, the, the Previsan computing center, the new one. 
Uh, and then we have these uh, dedicated private networks uh, connecting out to the tier ones. Uh, the tier twos have slightly slower connection, but they have their own private network. And then of course the, the internet. But uh, that, that's kind of the medium term plan. But if we want to look at uh, e even longer, the long term plan, um, CERN uh, works on the uh, the strategy document that, 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 that we use to develop our plans is called the European Strategy for Particle Physics. Um, it was initiated in 2006 and it was updated in 2013. And then it was updated again last year, uh, just about one year ago on the 19th of June. And uh, the cornerstone of uh, this document, of course, is always we need a bigger particle smashing machine. So the, um, the, the headline um, is the, the future circular collider, which will not be 27 kilometers long like the LHC, but 100 kilometers long. This is assuming that uh, we can get uh, the member states to fund it. Um, but uh, it does contain some um, some headlines for computing, the plans of the, the future of scientific computing. So um, this includes large scale data intensive software and computing infrastructures, common coordinated research and development effects in collaboration with other fields of science and industry and open data and data preservation. So um, collaboration with other fields of science and industry is really the, the up and coming model. Um, the Helix Nebula Science Cloud was, was a beginning of this, and now they're looking forward to the other broader collaborations with other sciences. And uh, open data and data preservation are very hot topics because this is something that maybe hasn't been considered enough in the past. So if you have some analysis software, say, from an experiment that ran 10 years ago, maybe you still have the source code of that software, but it doesn't compile because the, your current compiler has a different dialect of the language. Um, or even if you can compile it, you don't have the libraries or you don't have the operating system that it, that it runs on. So we've begun to realize that data preservation is more than just about preserving the bits of the data and it's more than just preserving the source code. You really need to preserve an, uh, the complete running environment in which that analysis was done in case you need to reproduce it in future. Um, so some of the computing challenges that we're facing for the high luminosity LHC run four, this is end of the decade and beyond, future circular and linear colliders and large neutrino experiments will together require about an order of magnitude more computing resources presently available while increase in funding for computing is not expected. So you can see this is the same story that they've been talking about since 1959 in that first annual report. We need, we need a more powerful machine. We need more powerful computers. So um, some of the challenges which are ahead, um, Moore's law doesn't hold anymore. And it's very difficult to predict hardware costs. Um, of course, there are other things upsetting uh, hardware costs. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware at the moment of the effect of uh, cryptocurrency mining on, on uh, uh, hardware procurement. So uh, this unpredictability is something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, hardware evolution. So computing resources are becoming increasingly heterogeneous. Um, no longer do we, you just have a CPU. Maybe you have an FPGA alongside it, or you have GPUs. Um, and then other more esoteric form, forms of computing hardware. Um, data storage management and preservation. Well, this is again, is a common theme. The needs of the future projects exceed the predicted capacity and affordability of the current model. So we, we need to think of uh, how we're going to solve this problem for run four. Uh, the software challenges. So we have legacy software, which is still running today, but it was written, maybe it wasn't even multi-threaded, certainly not written to take advantage of GPUs or other modern uh, hardware architectures. So the software needs to be rewritten in order to take advantage of the computing power which is available. And uh, there's a skills gap. You know, physicists in general are not taught how to program on um, new computing architectures. Um, so research and development, uh, some of the things that we're, we're going to be focusing on. Um, heterogeneous computing, so because hardware is becoming more, more heterogeneous, GPUs, FPGAs, uh, tensor processing units, of course, machine learning is very much uh, in vogue. Um, so this is, this is something we're going to need to do a lot of research and, and uh, development work in, in to, to make the most efficient use of these heterogeneous hardware platforms and specialized hardware. Um, hybrid cloud, so the Helix 
Um, Helix Nebula was one example of this, but uh, as um, as I described, Helix Nebula is mainly providing compute and a place to run programs. Um, we haven't really got a solution yet for, for hybrid storage. Um, so th this is something that's that's being looked at by a number of a number of projects and will will be one of the themes for R D in the future. And uh, data organization management and access. So uh, Access includes open access to data, which is increasingly being demanded by, by funding agencies and somehow needs to be built into to the computing infrastructure as to how this can be achieved. Um, so software R&D, um, if we have better software, greater physics opportunities within the fixed resource budget, it solves that problem of, I need more computing power. Um, there'll be hardware infrastructure development and support and uh, we also need to prepare for, for new technologies on the horizon. So, um, for example, we've started a project looking at quantum computing. Um, neuromorphic computing is another one that, that could be considered in the future. So these, are, these technologies are not being used in our current data analysis, but we're beginning to evaluate them and think about how they might be able to be used in future. So uh, just a quote from the European strategy. Um, the opportunities for, for HEP high, high energy physics to improve and generate new software by organizing the community, reaching out to industry, software engineers, and other sciences. So that's that's kind of the, the trajectory we're trying to move on. Um, so just a few words about other fields besides particle physics. Um, one very natural um, uh, other science that, that we work with very closely is astronomy, astronomy and astroparticle physics, because their data management issues are very similar to, to those of particle physics. And uh, CERN has a data management stack called RUSIO, which is already used by LIGO, the Gravitational Wave Observatory, and uh, Square Kilometer Array, the um, astro Astronomy Radio Telescope, and other, other large radio telescopes. So there's already quite a lot of cooperation for ast astrophysics. Um, but there are other fields as well. So in life sciences, for example, um, this paper was just, just published uh, recently, a month or two ago, and uh, about the, the, the folding of the, the protein in the COVID virus, um, published in Nature Chem Chemistry. And just in the acknowledgments there, you can see thanks to CERN and the particle physics community for helping with data management. So already we're, you know, we're helping with, uh, with other sciences because the data management issues are, are really the same. And uh, so other big sciences, um, Helix Nebula Science Cloud is already used by life sciences um, for uh, genomics, um, genetic sequencing, um, modeling of uh, protein docking, uh, femtosecond X-ray crystallography, X-ray imaging. And uh, you know there's a long tail of other sciences who, who are able to use the same infrastructures and the same uh, data management tools. Um, and next week in Geneva, well, now, now online because of COVID, but um, there's the, the Platform for Advanced Scientific Com Computing Conference, PASC21. And this, this is really looking at scientific computing and it's organized around eight domains. So you can see these domains are beginning to converge together. So there's, there's physics, obviously, um, particle physics, astrophysics, also other kinds of physics, pl plasma modeling, quantum chrono chromodynamics, um, life sciences, I already mentioned, chemistry and materials, climate and weather. Now, climate and weather, when these guys are talking about clouds, they mean literal clouds. And uh, they have an interesting problem. The European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting is trying to reduce its forecasting model from a five kilometer radius to one kilometer and from, um, uh, so I think it's a four hour prediction ahead to one hour prediction ahead. So um, that's that means they need 100 times more compute and storage to, to do that. So they have some, some interesting problems in, in terms of data movement and um, da data storage. Uh, they also, of course, if you're doing a, a weather prediction, you're working against a tight time, timeline. You need, your, you need your prediction to be ready for the next hour. You can't, you can't run over. Um, so yeah, weather is a very interesting one. Um, and then of course, in general, solid earth dy dynamics, computer science, applied mathematics, engineering, emerging application domains, that means things like finance and even social sciences. So all, all of the sciences are really converging together around these same computing problems. Um, 
And this is just some of the projects which are uh, underway. European Open Science Cloud is a European Commission project. Um, and CERN is one of the main implementation partners uh, for that. So this will be a common science cloud used by, by all of the sciences. So that really brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, just uh, a few words on, on to summarize and uh, give the outlook for the next years. High energy physics has been one of the most demanding users of computing ever since the 1950s. And phys physicists continue to make increasing demands on compute storage and data movement. It's clear that budgets aren't going to rise to meet the, the demand and the high energy physics community is responding with innovation and ever more efficient use of hardware and adoption of new technologies. Um, it's no longer the case that high energy physics is the only big science. Astronomy, life sciences, many other scientific and commercial domains are ever more data intensive. And the future is collaboration. CERN's at the forefront of efforts to build shared projects for scientific computing in Europe and around the world. And I'll just finish with a quick plug. Um, CERN is always looking for good computer scientists and software engineers. I just did a quick search on um, careers.cern and uh, there's half a dozen computing fellowships that have just gone online within the last few days. Um, every month there are new computing jobs um, be, being listed on, on careers.cern. So um, if, if you have any kind of computing skill, programming, um, full stack developer, um, you, or you work in a data center and it, uh, at any level, we're, we're always uh, recruiting people. So take a look. Thank you very much. That was that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, I love the wee pitch at the end. Come work at the antimatter <laughs> pantry, you know. So <laughs> Exactly. Brilliant. Uh, well, we have a whole pile of questions here, but we only have time for a couple. So uh, I'm just going to pick a few. So first of all, Given that you're the, the custodian of like the master or even the yeah, only yeah. copy of the data, how do you manage your testing? You know, how do you make sure that something has been successfully written? How do you make sure there's compatibility going forwards? Um, how do you do your disaster planning? You know, what happens if the Illuminati invade and burn down <laughs> everything? So what, what kind of infrastructure is in place there? Yeah. So in, in general, um, for the physics data, we, in general, we do have two copies. So we have one copy at tier zero, which goes on the tape libraries here, and then another copy, which is distributed around the rest of the grid. So um, lose, losing files uh, is, is a, a rare event on tape, but because we have so many of them, it does, it does happen. So if we lose a file, generally, we can, we can find another copy somewhere else on the grid and, and, and copy in the, the copy that we're missing. But um, it is one of the reasons why we use tape storage because tape is a lot more reliable and durable than, than storing data on disk. Um, the, just from the point of view of the, the media, um, it's, it's not spinning all the time. It's sitting, it's sitting in a slot somewhere. You have um, air, an air gap from the drive. So it'd be very difficult for, for example, for um, if, if an attacker could infiltrate CERN and, and try to RMRF all of our data, um, you know, it would, take, it would take several years to delete all the data on tape because all the tapes <laughs> would have to be mounted. So, so there's that kind of air, air gap protection. Um, so um, the, the tape uh, technology gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot of reliability and confidence. Um, the tape drives themselves. Actually, when you, when you write data onto tape, the tape has two heads. It has a write head and a read head. So you write, you write onto the media, and then you immediately read back what you just wrote. So you have you have confidence that what's there on the on the media is is what you wrote. Um, so those those really are the two um, the two keys. Oh. One is reliable storage, and the second is having the second distributed copy. Brilliant. And then uh, in terms of the file formats, do you use file formats supported by like commercial database vendors or tape storage companies, or did you have to go out and create your own? No, in general, we create our own. Um, the, well, the, the format that we use for, for the data on tape is, this, is the same. You know, it, has, it hasn't changed in 20 years mm -hmm. um, because we have all of this legacy data and we don't want to, you know, if you want to change your file format, then you have to rewrite 340 petabytes of data and no one wants to do that. So we're not going to change it. Um, so this is, it, it, it was based on uh, some ISO standard at the time, uh, which I could look up, but I can't remember what it is. Um, in terms of the physics data formats, I mean, those, those formats are, 
they're managed by the experiment. So in, in terms of our storage, you know, we just get a blob and we put it on tape and what's inside it, we don't care. The physicists care about that. Cool, very good. And then just uh, one last question, purely for my own curiosity. Um, I know a lot of sysadmins who like to come into the office on public holidays so they can like uh, play games and the hardware and so <laughs> on. So during the shutdown, I mean, with 300,000 cores at your disposal, I mean, you could mine <laughs> thousands of Bitcoin or build four Angular applications. I mean, you know, were you ever tempted to just play with the hardware? Well, um... My, mining Bitcoin is explicitly uh, forbidden. You're not you're not allowed to do anything on CERN's hardware, which is for commercial purposes mm -hmm. or uh, for financial gain. Let's say so. But uh, I mean, otherwise, if if you want to get your own virtual machine, a few virtual machines, and mm -hmm. and do something, you as as individuals, the CERN computing rules allows you to use the CERN facilities for personal personal use within reason, so long as you're not causing any interference to the the production facilities. So. Sure, sure, if you want to I, compile a few yeah, things. Yeah, at, at, at that stage, I think all you can do is a Bond <laughs> villain. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. So listen, thank you so much. Um, we will bring you back at the end for the any questions. Yeah. Uh, but time is against us, so I must dismiss you at this point. Yeah. And uh, if I can ask um, uh, Peter and Gerald to uh, to take the stage. Gentlemen, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Scott. And over to you, Gerald. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm myself and Peter from Liberty IT in Belfast will deliver a talk on well-architected service-first infrastructure of CDK. I'm Gerald. I'm a software engineer at Liberty IT and an AWS community builder for the DevTools category. And I'm Peter. Senior Software Engineer at Liberty IT and an AWS Community Builder for the Networking and Content Delivery category. So why is Liberty Mutual, a large and old insurance company, interested in AWS and serverless? At Liberty Mutual, we protect people across the globe and then we need to be there when they call upon us in their hour of need. We can't afford to waste time with technology that doesn't work. We need scalable solutions that are highly available so we can support our customers in their time of need. We exist to help people embrace today and confidently pursue tomorrow. So we are Liberty IT. We build the critical IT systems that support this important mission. We are a top 10 plane, top 10 great place to work for the UK and Ireland and an active member of business in the community. Just this week, we've also been recognized, confirmed as one of the best places to work for women in the UK in the Lord, for the large organization category. We've been awarded the diversity charter mark for our work with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've also been recognized by AWS for our work. We have three AWS heroes, Gillian McCann and Gillian Armstrong, both machine learning heroes, and Matt Coulter, a DevTools hero. We also have five AWS community builders, Darren Broderick, Matthew Dorian, Card Kick, Peter, and I, helping drive our cloud journey and representing us at global events such as reInvent. Between ourselves and Liberty Mutual, we have the most community builders out of any company reflective of the great work our employees do both internally and externally. Yeah, so much like at CERN, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here at Liberty. We've been building amazing computing experiences for, for year, decades throughout Liberty. Liberty's been an insurance company for over 100 years and there's thus, thus has numerous IT systems dating back many decades. As with any large enterprise, we need to take change in a gradual manner due to the sheer size of our organization, over 50,000 employees and around 5,000 in IT. So our transition to the cloud has occurred over a number of years. We initially started out with the internal private cloud, utilizing our existing US data centers, which in 2014, we transitioned to ad additionally support public cloud workloads, much like CERN, a hybrid cloud approach here. Throughout the course of the next few years, and as I started out at the company myself, much of this hybrid and public cloud workloads paved the way for our successes today, establishing enterprise secrets management, build and deployment tooling, and support, which we continue to leverage to this day. During my placement in 2016-17, I was part of the program that started to drive the adoption of containerization at Liberty, running directly on top of EC2 with a brief orchestration layer. This offering was really the first time that Liberty was able to truly harness the power of the public cloud, particularly when it comes to scalability. 
In 2019, a portal was created to allow engineers to create the necessary components required to start developing on AWS in minutes. The software accelerator was the biggest enabler of the of biggest, biggest enabler of Liberty's service first mission because it created code, Git repositories, and CI CD pipelines in minutes. This saved days of work by implementing heavy lifting and common tasks that would normally need to be performed by development teams looking to get started on AWS. 2019 is where we really seen the emergence of our serverless first mission, a shift from the 2017 container strategy. Serverless first does not mean that all new projects need to be serverless, just that it's the first consideration over traditional architecture or containerized solution. Fast forward into 2021, we are well along with our serverless first goal. AWS recently released a case study on how Liberty Mutual is using AWS Lambda to run massive workloads in the cloud at a very low cost. Just search for Liberty Mutual AWS case study and it should be the top result. The next part of our story is not just serverless first, but well-architected serverless first. You might wonder, what does well-architected mean? How do I achieve it? Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Gerald. So Gerald, as Gerald said, what is well-architected? Well, the well-architected framework is a tool for assessing the trade-offs that you make between business needs and best practices when building your application. Dr. Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, unveiled the framework at reInvent in 2015, starting with the white papers around its five white pillars applicable to all applications in the eyes of AWS. Those pillars are operational excellence. This pillar is centered around monitoring, uh, running and monitoring our systems to deliver business value and continuously improving processes and procedures. Security, pretty self-explanatory. With any workload in the modern world, it's vital that we protect our information, system and assets while continuing to deliver on the business value through risk assessment techniques, such as threat modeling and for appropriate mitigation strategies. Reliability. This covers the ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service disruption, mitigate dip disruption or degradation in general, and to scale up and down to meet the needs of our customers as their demands change. Performance efficiency. This area focuses on the efficient use of compute resources in line with the requirements they need to meet and continuing to meet that efficiency as demand changes and most importantly, as technologies evolve. And finally, cost optimization. In the modern business world, our business stakeholders are keen to see cost-effective solutions as our competitors and new, new startups are adopting similar low-cost solutions. We need to adapt to this market. We need to continuously assess and refine the cost of our system to avoid unnecessary cost. Since the framework has unveiled, additional white papers have been published around various lenses that are applicable to different workloads. For example, serverless, which Gerald will talk about later, and AI and machine learning. The white papers for each pillar and each lens comprehensively break down the practices that you should be considering applying to your workloads, and most importantly, why you should be considering applying those practices to your workload. At the end of the day, business value is at the center of everything. I'll add at this point, you can apply the well-architected frameworks to running in any cloud infrastructure. It's not just limited to the scope of AWS. With cloud infrastructure, teams are given the autonomy to control many of those factors that they, not, would, they previously would have not been able to control in a traditional data center environment. For, exist, for instance, cost optimization, so we can scale down compute resources when they're not being used. Each pillar and lens has its own set of questions provided in the appendix and a lot that line up with the best practices defined in their respective white papers. AWS recommends that you consider these questions as part of what they call a well-architected review. To aid this process, the AWS well-architected tool is available in the AWS console. You can use this to guide you and your team through the process of answering these questions to assess your application. I thoroughly recommend this for assessing your application my team has been going through it recently, and it's been tremendously valuable for identifying infrastructure, code, and process improvements that we can apply to build a better experience for our customers going forward. After you complete a well-architected review, you get a report out as either HTML or PDF with an improvement plan detailed. You can then send this on to your colleagues, your, your managers, your stakeholders, and work against it to improve your application. You can save snap milestones or snapshots in the tool to see your improvement over time, as continuous improvement is at the center of everything we do at Liberty IT. 
So, talked a lot about theory, how do we put this into practice here? What's the business value of being serverless first, well architected? Well, over the last year, we've started to see traffic patterns that diverge significantly from what we've seen over the, the, the past hundred years that Liberty Mutual has been operating. Traditionally, our insurance claims are constant and they're always our highest priority. We want to be able to help our customers in their times of, time of need. At the start of COVID, the clearance for claim status in blue here dramatically reduced. This has rarely happened without, throughout Liberty's history in computing. Our system shrank in response appropriately delivering the best, most cost-effective solution for our stakeholders. Our second system here, the orange line, details what the, the outgoing payment system to our customers. Traditionally, this is a low volume system that sees slow and steady throughput, as you can see up to April there. However, Liberty announced that we'd refund some policy payments. As such, the team decided to put an unprecedented, unprecedented amount of traffic through the system on very short notice. The system scaled massively in response. Both of these are serverless first, well-architected systems, which Liberty IT has had an involvement in building. All the teams needed to do was check a few account limits. The systems responded appropriately. This is what happens when you apply a serverless first mindset in action. And just oh. Getting a bit of feedback there, John. A pod. And then I guess the AWS EK patterns. The AWS is a oh, framework. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You, you kind of got going all Jean Michel yeah. genre there, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to give it a wee second and try and fix it there? Yep. Yes, yes. Uh, my Thanks, AirPods died in the middle. So, <laughs> um, so in the next few slides, I will introduce the AWS Cloud Development Kit and CDK patterns. The AWS Cloud Development Kit is a framework for defining your cloud infrastructure as commonly used programming languages. It currently supports six languages, TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, .NET, Java, and has beta support for Go. For me, the biggest differentiator between using CloudFormation directly, serverless framework, and CDK is the programming language support that CDK provides. Defining your infrastructure as TypeScript with IDE supported autocomplete is game changing. CDK applications are composed of a few components, notably apps, the outermost box in this diagram. You can have multiple stacks within an app. Stacks, otherwise known as CloudFormation stacks, under the hood, CDK applications, when built, will produce a CloudFormation template that is then deployed. The actual code that you write isn't deployed. Constructs. Constructs can be used to create resources. This could be one single resource, such as an S3 bucket or a Lambda function, or a high level of high level abstraction could be created using constructs that create commonly used resources together and reduce the amount of code duplication. Most AWS services have their own package containing constructs needed to create the resources. These are made up of three different levels. Level one constructs are bare cloud formation resources. When using these, you must explicitly configure all resource properties, which requires a complete understanding of, and the, of the details of the underlying cloud, AWS cloud formation resource model. These can be useful if what you're trying to do can't easily be accomplished using the CDK array. Typically be avoided as you won't get the same level as autocomplete support as CDK. Level two constructs represent AWS resources at a higher level. They provide similar functionality, but provide defaults, boilerplate, and glue logic that you'd be writing yourself with a CFN resource construct. AWS constructs offer convenient defaults and reduce the need to know all the details about the AWS resources they represent. By working, by providing convenience methods that 
make it simpler to work with the resources. Level 2 constructs are what you really want to be using day to day. You'll get the IE autocomplete support and the benefits of defining your infrastructure as code starting at this level. The next is level 3 constructs, also commonly referred to as patterns, which are designed to help you complete common tasks in AWS, often involving multiple kinds of resources or overriding, overriding or extending the base AWS L2 constructs. These can be useful for reducing duplication of common L2 construct patterns. However, I would advise I would exercise caution in choosing to use these as there is always a risk of over abstraction. In this example, I have created a new a new class, Encrypted Bucket, that will support all of the same properties as a standard bucket class from AWS, but with the encryption set to S3 managed. This is an example of how we use L3 constructs at Liberty to help give engineers easy to use constructs that are compliant with our enterprise standards. In the next few slides, we will discover how the AWS Cloud Development Kit can be used in combination with the AWS Well-Architected Framework. CDK Patterns is an open source collection of serverless architecture patterns built using AWS CDK. With 27 patterns and counting from 17 creators, it is a great starting point for anybody interested in looking I think we lost you again there, child. I think he's gone, yes, uh, unfortunately. Yep. No, yep. Hello? These Apple products, if they all use stuff from Amazon, they'd be great. These <laughs> work. Go Am I here? Yes. yes yep. You're back. Yep. Um, founded by Matt Coulter, technical architect at Liberty IT and AWS DevTools Zero, it has received commendations from Amazon CTO Werner Vogels for the huge impact that has had on the adoption of the AWS CDK. Following the success of CDK patterns, Matt and others have organized two CDK day conferences and now have a popular Slack community with almost 3,000 members centered around the AWS CDK. Some CK, CDK patterns have been directly associated with the pillars of the well architected framework. The pattern matcher is available on the CDK Patterns website. For example, the pattern in the CloudWatch dashboard can be directly linked to the operational excellence pillar. As a refresher from earlier, the purpose of this pillar is to include the ability to run and monitor system to deliver business value and continually approve supporting processes and procedures. In order to meet this, a good starting point is to have proper monitoring and alerting set up for your systems. The CloudWatch dashboard is a CDK pattern that will give you an example CloudWatch dashboard metrics and graphs, including alerts and an SNS topic that can be used to monitor your systems. This is a great example of how easy it is to combine CDK and well architected. So far, we have covered CDK patterns and well architected. I've got you interested. Now you want to know how to get hands on with the AWS CDK. If you want to take a CDK pattern and deploy it to your own AWS account and have a look at how it works, in this screenshot, I was able to accomplish this in under five minutes without needing to clone any code or install anything on my own machine. At reInvent 2020, AWS released CloudShell. It gives you command line access to your AWS account through it in your browser through the AWS console. If you're interested in trying out any of the patterns, the CDK pattern CLI combined with CloudShell is a quick and easy way to do so with three simple commands. In the next slide, I'm going to cover how we have enabled the use of CDK patterns and the AWS Well-Architected Framework at Liberty Mutual to enable engineers to build better quality applications faster than ever. CDK patterns and CDK in general has been a massive accelerator in enabling our engineers to build on AWS. We have a few different tools available within Liberty for automating the creation of new projects. The software accelerator helps engineers create Git repository, example source code, testing, code quality tools, and CI CD pipelines in minutes. It's as simple as picking your template, entering a project name, and a few other Liberty specific fields, and you'll have a working deployable project. This level of automation enables our engineers to focus on business value over wasting time on project setup. We have adapted almost all of the open source CDK patterns to enable them to be quickly deployed to our AWS accounts. These serve as both fantastic reference architectures and experimentation opportunities for our engineers. Combining automation, compliance, best practices, 
eases the burden of building on AWS for engineers at Liberty, which overall contributes to our goal of being a serverless first, well architected organization. So you ask, what impact has this had? 55% of global risk solutions is now serverless first on AWS. This is about half of the company. Software Accelerator CDK Core, an inner source CDK library of level three constructs that handles a lot of the Liberty specific requirements is being now used across all Liberty Mutual. This is a game changer. In years gone past, Liberty Mutual's global risk solutions and global retail markets would have separate solutions for this one problem. I have been privileged to be part of the work that drove this adoption across markets. Previously, each team would have been rewriting this code in cloud formation as you couldn't create abstractions or libraries. Now, even smaller teams can easily spin up libraries of their own or contribute back into some of the more company-wide libraries if it's appropriate. We've also been recognized by AWS for our contributions. Matt Coulter was made an AWS DevClose Hero for his work with CDK, CDK Patterns, and CDK Day. I can also attribute my sentence as an AWS community builder, the DevClose category, to the opportunities that I have had to contribute to CDK Patterns, write blogs on the CDK, and promote the usage within Liberty. Thanks. As Gerald mentioned, we're utilizing CDK to define our stacks as code in the language of our choice. For years, infrastructure was manually managed. Then we started to transition to configuration management software such as Puppet and Chef. And then we started adopting cloud management systems such as CloudFormation. But at the end of the day, the full benefit of code that we've been able to realize with our UI libraries and backend libraries has not been fully realized of these. CDK though, allows us to truly harness that potential and get rid of the quotes around infrastructure as code. Here we're going to look, look into a snapshot of how reuse at Liberty works to date. So at Liberty, we have hundreds of teams working on various different domains across several different divisions of the organization. As with every enterprise, the level of repeated effort is quite significant. To reduce this repeated effort, we can apply reuse at numerous levels. For years, we've been applying reuse at a more granular level within our code bases for UI frameworks, implementing our brand guidelines or for shared libraries. Traditionally, this started as reuse within a team and then maybe bubbled up to the department level and down into other teams. Then maybe up to the division and down into other teams within that division. And then up to the enterprise level and down into teams within different divisions. We can also think about applying reuse at a product level. For example, sharing a document, ge document generation capability between divisions. But for years, this area has evaded us, even our, for our infrastructure. Sorry. So let's take a look at that, that piece I just have talked about, the bit that's been evading us. So in my previous program, we had 15 teams working across several trains, each spinning up numerous microservices per quarter. All of these microservices could be traced back to that one sample microservice that my team provided on the first day of the program in 2019. As of July 2021, within that one program, we had 80 instances of the same CloudFormation template deployed across numerous teams to stand up that Spring Boot microservice. In the context of CloudFormation within Liberty, that meant duplicating, i.e. forking the CFT every time a new microservice was needed, as Gerald mentioned. We saw on numerous occasions that teams would edit the templates and perhaps inject a small configuration error or a bespoke change to their use case. And then another team would come along and fork that repo rather than the original repo and duplicate that mistake or bespoke configuration change. If my team, which is a central services team, needed to apply a fix across all those forks, no matter how minor, even just one line of cloud formation or one config change, it required us to propagate that out across those 80 apps across 15 teams. That process end to end could take months. Okay, apparently that is. All that re repetition impeded our ability to run at speed and deliver that competitive business adv advantage we want for our business. Modifying CFTs 80 times is not differentiating work that makes us stand out from our competitors, competitors and deliver better experience for our customers. Spending time in meetings and working on changes, coordinating that 
is taking away from the time that we can be spending building quality solutions for our customers. It's quite literally my definition of hell. So much duplicitous effort. But there is a better way, much like there's in open parks and rec says here. AWS took their idea of infrastructure as code that they set with AWS Cloud Formation and they made it better, miles better. With CDK, we've been able to encapsulate the repeated infrastructure definition into constructs akin to Lego blocks. AWS provides these, sorry, AWS provides a bunch of these as Gerald covered in their level two constructs. We can go from copying code to importing libraries as we would in our UIs and backends. We can apply super minimal abstractions on top of AWS constructs, e.g. automatically setting the tags for a resource so that harkening back to the AWS well-architected framework, we can track its TCO for analysis. Or we can apply a slight deal more of abstraction, harkening back to Gerald's example, mandating the adoption of server-side encryption on a bucket. If an engineer isn't happy with an abstraction, they can fork the repo and contribute back or they can extend it and override settings for your object orientation. We can encapsulate larger concepts into patterns and break, the break into the entire stack serverless first, well-architected principles and deploy it out of the box in minutes, compliant with enterprise standards. So talked a lot here about theory. How have I actually put this into practice? So last year, I was working on a team that we needed to deploy a React client out into our environment. I implemented a CloudFront construct within the scope of our stack that created a distribution backed by an S3 bucket encompassing Liberty Mutual's best-in-class security practices. At the end, there's 400 lines of CDK code with extensive docs in JS doc, automatic markdown generation with JSII doc, and comprehensive security checks, standards that we've come to expect on our Liberty Mutual constructs as well as in the open source community. In CFT, this would be 752 lines of template, a significant amount of repeated code. At the time, CloudFront was ava wasn't available to the rest of the organization. So I knew if I could get my findings out to my colleagues at LIT and across the globe, it could save my te numerous teams in our organization hours or days of time. I'd personally been working in CloudFront since 2017, so I was keen to share my knowledge in the area. It's a great service, but it is quite slow to deploy and it is quite hard to configure. So getting everything right out of the box is greatly important in delivering on that competitive advantage that we need. I worked at Inisource this code and made it available as a library. Teams can then import it with a single line and add six lines of code, as you can see there. We then added it to the internal patterns for web apps to make adoption as seamless as possible. Teams can now deploy a S3, S3 backed React client or Angular client compliant with enterprise standards in a matter of minutes. Since its general release last week, I've been able to see the construct applied across every division of the company and save our engineers hours of research and work. Through this, our engineers are quickly able to adopt this service and leverage the extensibility of AWS's own construct as new features come in. For example, the addition of cloud font functions last week with a new version of the CDK. Sorry, one second. Uh, sorry about that. There we go. Can you hit that thing? Sorry. So what's the advantage this has been able to deliver? By leveraging CDK, we've been able to move away from duplicated CFTs towards standard, simple CDK constructs and patterns that are far easier to patch due to a single source of truth. We've been able to take manual steps out of the setup process and thus increase our time to market, sorry, reduce our time to market by providing well-architected service application blueprints with CI-CD pipeline and Git repo for engineers in minutes, as Gerald mentioned. We've been able to leverage the learnings of our colleagues and the open source community across the enterprise to build well-architected service applications. 
we've been able to take weeks or months of research from those internal and external experts and bake it down into patterns, applying those best practices as encompassed, in, encompassed within AWS Well Architected that can be adopted by anyone in minutes. By leveraging the power of CDK in this way at Liberty Mutual, we've been able to save us time to market and allow our engineers to focus on what matters, the business value that their application can provide. All of that, pretty awesome in my opinion. In the next few slides, I'm going to go over an example of how Well Architected can be used to improve the system and how that can be related back to business objectives. I was part of a team responsible for creating enterprise patterns. We consumed the software accelerator library and implemented various examples of how it could be used to retrieve secrets and look up VPC information. Our generator produced an API gateway that could be backed with lambdas, it would be public or private, and come with or without a custom authorizer. We wanted to ensure that out of the box, our generated applications were well architected, setting our customers up for success by providing them with a solid base to build on and sensible defaults. Since our pattern was serverless, we applied the serverless lens during our well architected review. Apologies, Peter, I have lost the ability yeah, to sorry. click yeah. to the next thing. <laughs> um, the question we look at is from the reliability pillar of the serverless lens. The question is, how do you regulate inbound request rates? As Peter discussed earlier, if you're doing one of the practices on the list, you should tick the box. This is a particularly important question for, for serverless applications for two reasons. If you get hit with a large amount of traffic in a short period of time, your application could scale massively, incurring new cost. Or you could have downstream resources that are not scalable that need to be protected, such as a traditional mainframe system. Now, as we want to make our customers think about request rate limiting, we decided to add a rate limiting example to our generated application. For customer facing applications, I would recommend adding API keys on a per customer basis, allowing for the ability to identify who is making what request and configure limits based on that customer. I would also want to insulate those non-scalable resources. Your serverless applications scale massively, and that is a huge benefit of a serverless architecture. If your company is as old as Liberty, chances are somewhere you're calling a much older non-serverless application. You don't want to take that down if you get a massive spike in traffic. CDK Patterns has two great examples of how to properly protect non-scalable resources, one using RDS proxy and one using an SKS key and a throttled Lambda. Worth checking out to get a better idea of how to implement these buffers. So why is this important? Liberty Mutual's goal is to help our customers live safer, more secure lives. Our claims applications are critical to us being, us being able to support our customers during their time of need. Now, in the context of the previous question, malicious actions against our services could render them unavailable to customers when needed us the most. Applications that are well architected have considerations and action plans in place for occurrences like this. For example, an API key can easily be revoked if it's found to be abused, quickly ending any further abuse and restoring access for legitimate customers. Scenarios like this make well architected not just another buzzword for engineers to add to their CVs. By performing and consistently reevaluating well architected reviews, we ensure our systems are ready for any eventuality that better serve our customers when they need us the most. As Liberty continues our well architected serverless first journey, I look forward to hearing of more great success stories from other organizations about how they are also realizing the benefit of conducting these reviews. Thanks, Gerald. So, in conclusion, what should you go home and do? Or go, go on to another Zoom call and do? Go out there and look to adopt CDK. Leverage those simpler stack definitions that come from writing infrastructure as actual code and not YAML or JSON that can be abstracted into libraries and reused across your organization or into the open source community. Drive that internal reuse as we've done through low, low abstraction constructs and patterns and benefit from the work of the open source CDK community. Go out, delve into the AWS Well Architected Framework. You can reuse it as a really good tool to assess your application and make everything better for your stakeholders, yourselves, and your customers. Go out and check out CDK Patterns. You can really simply go to, go to their site and learn how to build world-class, well-architected service applications with CDK, and it only takes you a matter of minutes. Go and leverage the learnings of those subject matter experts from across the, the industry. 
So thanks for listening and thanks to Bash for having us. If you want to join us at Liberty in our serverless, well architected journey, delivering better experiences for our global customers, search Liberty IT Careers on your search engine of choice or check us out at the socials on screen now. Over to you, Garth. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you for the talk. Um, so a uh, few questions here from YouTube. So uh, are your CDK modules in a CI CD pipeline? And if so, how are you doing unit testing? Yes, I think I can cover that one. Um, for the, for instance, the application that I'm doing, we, we sort of have standards set. So we're, we're doing unit testing on that. Uh, we're using Jest uh, against that. You can do sort of two different types of testing. You can do snapshot testing, which sort of assesses the CFT that your CDK produces, or you can go in and test individual properties on your CDK stack. Um, and then we're running that through um, CI CD pipelines that run those tests continuously on every branch that gets contributed so that we ensure that uh, what's being fed back by our other internal contributors is, is in line with what we need to be producing and isn't going to impact anyone downstream. And I've also got like contract tests in there as well. So if the contract changes on the API, uh, you don't want to go and break someone. So we'd introduce a sort of new major version if there's a breaking change coming in as you would do with any semantically version application. Cool. And then these uh, the, these constructs, libraries, abstractions, you know, that you're creating, um, how, how stable are they? You know, how confident are you in them going forward? I mean, you know, the underlying AWS services stable enough that they're still going to be there in, in years to come? Yeah, um, I think for, oh, uh, I think from my perspective, um, yeah, they're definitely there. We, we, we focus on making those abstractions very, very, very minimal. Um, we don't want to be building a huge opinionated uh, piece on top, as Gerald said. Uh, if, if you build a massive opinion into it, your peers aren't going to want to use it. The open source community is not want, going to want to use it. Uh, so you need to focus on keeping them simple. Um, and if you keep it simple, it, the, the API changes tend not to break. Uh, CloudFormation is always backwards compatible, as is CDK. So we're not going to see that, that rug pulled out from underneath us in that sense. Cool. Very good. Like that, Gerald. No, that's what I was going to say. You know, AWS is really good with their version strategy. All of the packages are at the same version. They release every package regardless if there's a change or not. So, um, and they are working on a 2.0 version of the CDK packages, which is going to have improved. Um, it's, it's going to be one gigantic package to prevent people having lots of dependency issues that are exist of CDK at the minute. Very good, very good. And then the, the question that everybody hates, yeah, um, what hasn't worked? You know, what, what do you think was the, the biggest misstep along the way? You know, so with, with 2020 hindsight and all the benefits of retrospectives and so on, what, what should have been done better? Yeah. I think Gerald's got a good example about sort of uh, driving reuse of internal libraries between his team and another team. Yeah, so I, um, I worked on an enablement team in one market and we had our own CDK library for a while and it didn't work. Um, we had sort of like level three constructs um, and we found that after a while, like people didn't like that. And that is why I would advise everybody to stay away from anything that isn't, um, you know, like we keep the non-opinionated constructs. I mentioned software accelerator, CDK core, that's non-opinionated, that is, undifferentiated heavy lifting in that library and helper functions as opposed to opinionated patterns. Um, mm -hmm. So like Peter said, and I said mentioned the PowerPoint, opinionated patterns don't really work for constructs. Um, if you're doing that on a small, like on a smaller platform, like within your team, maybe yes, one or two teams, but when you're talking across the enterprise, it's not gonna be widely used. Cool, so, uh, so keep your opinions to yourself then. So. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Listen, thank you so much. Yeah, um, we will have you back at the end for the old questions, you know, but uh, time marches on. So I dismiss you, or rather, Ryan dismisses you. And uh, if I can call uh, Jayanthon to, uh, to do our final talk. And uh, just before you start, a little vote of thanks, because uh, Lisa was due to this delivery, but had to withdraw at the last minute. So we're, we're very, very grateful to you for stepping in. So thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, Garth, and thanks, gentlemen. Um, it was uh, not only was it well architected, it was very well articulated as well. Um, you know, I was sitting through Michael's um, um, session, felt like sitting in a physics class, 
that's something that I really loved um, and high energy physics was my favorite topic. So uh, moving on to my session today, uh, special thanks to uh, Lisa and Bash, uh, Lisa in particular. So uh, she's part of my team, so she couldn't make it because of the uh, laser eye surgery that she's going on today. Um, I'm not too sure if she's logged in, but if she is, thank you very much, Lisa, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So quick introduction about me. Uh, I'm Jayant, um, I'm, uh, I'm the senior cloud architect for Microsoft Hybrid Cloud, working for Team Geos at Dell. Geos stands for Global Engineering Outreach Specialist, so we are part of the engineering organization. We support sales and pre-sales in the respective regions. Um, as part of our job, we are not only responsible for supporting our sales and pre-sales, we, we do evangelism for the, the Azure Stack family of products today. Um, we are uh, speakers, we are uh, bloggers, so you see us pretty much everywhere and most of the seminars today. So great time to be here. I never imagined I could fly in all the way from um, from Bangalore, which is Silicon Valley of India, uh, to be able to present a session in uh, in Bash today. So I'm available on uh, LinkedIn. So you know, feel free to uh, hit me up either on Twitter. On a personal front, um, I'm married. I am blessed with a. Uh, 12 year old uh, kid as well. Um, and my wife, uh, best of the beautiful wife, who happens to be a yoga teacher and also um, a Bharatnatyam dancer. So, those who do not know what Bharatnatyam is, so Bharatnatyam is actually a classical dance, Indian dance, which originates from the southern part of India. So, if you don't know, just Google, look it up, it's beautiful. Um, and also blessed with uh, a chess prodigy. Uh, my son happens to be the under seven national and uh, state champion. And he went on to represent India at the under eight uh, Asian championship as well. So that's pretty much about me and for as part of the agenda today. So we're gonna talk about why hybrid, why people are chasing hybrid today, what is the need? Um, and how Microsoft is really positioning and winning the hybrid story with the Azure Stack family. Um, in particular, for part of the Azure Stack family today, we're gonna to look at uh, what is Azure Stack at CI. Um, and well, I, I'm not gonna to do too much of talking. I believe in showing things. So um, I'm gonna delve right into the, you know, the live demo to show how Azure Stack at CI and Azure Arc actually you know, is put to work. All right, so today, uh, if you look at customers' environments or anything but simple, now, customer environments are diverse, complex, ever evolving. So we live in a multi-cloud world. Let's, know, let's make no mistake about it, right? Um, now, according to a Gartner study, about close to about 90% of the organizations today remain on a hybrid. And 93% of the enterprises have a multi-cloud strategy. Now, out of them, close to about 82% of them are already working with three or more public cloud service providers outside their own organization. I mean, these are mind boggling numbers. Um, as you can imagine, now the data is not going to stay in one cloud, right? It is predicted that over the next year, about close to about 50% of the applications and data will be distributed across multiple clouds. So if you look at uh, some of the customers who are managing this diverse, complex kind of environments, um, today, customers and service providers are looking to solve these kind of complex and diverse environments. They have a problem to solve. Now, they're looking at ways to easily deploy turnkey solutions for their IAS and PaaS workloads based on the, the elasticity and the consumption based cloud operating model. That's the key here. People are increasingly looking at cloud operating model on premises. Now, seamlessly be able to extend their applications and the data to the cloud. And not just that, they want to be able to write applications consistently and deploy them anywhere. Uh, think about use cases where I want to write an application which can be deployed on premises or on public cloud without me having to change a single line of code. Now, that's going to be a game changer. Now, most importantly, um, you know, they want to be able to control and manage all these, you know, distributed resources, right, from on-premises to the cloud, to the multiple clouds, from a single control pane of glass, securely and remotely. So 
if they can do this, this is going to be a game changer. So we're going to look at how Microsoft has been able to achieve this, uh, to tackle this you know, wonderful problem of managing complexity and diverse environments, which is kind of spread across on premises to public cloud. So if you look at Microsoft uh, Azure Stack family, so Azure Stack is the solution for all of this problem that we just that, that I just spoke about. Now, with that in mind, Microsoft has three distinct products today. One is Azure Stack Hub, HCI, and Edge. So what is Azure Stack Hub? Azure Stack Hub is nothing but, um, you know, you're literally delivering Azure services to on-premises. This is something that Microsoft rolled out way back in 2017. Obviously, AWS and GCP followed up with their game plan uh, with Outpost and um, um, uh, Anthos. So uh, with, with Azure Stack Hub, you're literally bringing pretty much a subset of Azure services within the customer's data center. So this can operate either in a connected model or in a disconnected model. Now, why does somebody want to bring um, Azure services to on-premises? Because they have a problem. They have a data sovereignty um, uh, to be complied with or a regulatory compliances to comply with. The data simply cannot leave the land or leave the country of origin. Um, GDPR is a classic example of that. In fact, I'm seeing um, many countries in the APJ that I'm operating out, operating out of, uh, they simply do not want any of these countries that I visit, they do not want to see their applications and data um, sitting in public cloud, especially coming from the government sectors. Now, uh, one other uh, use case of uh, the Azure Stack Hub that we're seeing these days is the application modernization. And today, uh, many enterprises are adopting a cloud native strategy. Now, for such customers who are looking to kind of go into cloud native streams, uh, Azure Stack Hub just fits the bill perfectly for them. So they can, you know, lift and shift some of their application on-premises applications onto Azure Stack Hub and slowly start the modernization journey at a later point of time. Azure Stack HCI, so I'm not going to talk too much about it because this is the this is a topic that we are going to be discussing on. Uh, it's nothing for it's nothing but for this is for customers today who are still not ready for the cloud journey, but they have a huge estate of on-premise infrastructure which they want to modernize. Think about situations where customers have a huge asset of three-tier SAN, or maybe they're running on bare metal uh, servers or distributed hypervisors. They want to kind of consolidate all of these data centers into probably a more software-defined. This is where Azure Stack HCI meets their needs. And Azure Stack Edge is completely sold and supported by Microsoft today, so you can order this is hardware as a service that's available from Microsoft Azure. So you can log into Microsoft Azure and order this as a hardware as a service that is delivered to you. So what does it do? Uh, those who are familiar with Azure world, um, they would definitely know Databox Edge. So Databox Edge has been rebranded as Azure Stack Edge today. So which is today more intelligence, which means it can run some of the cognitive services like AI, ML, IoT services, and so on and so forth. Think about use cases today where uh, you want to be able to do image inferencing or video inferencing at the edge. All right, so moving on. So what is Azure Stack at CI? Now, in December 2020, Microsoft announced the, the new Azure Stack at CI experience with features which are designed to transform the traditional IT environments into a highly agile hybrid cloud ecosystems. Now, you may be wondering what's new with this Azure Stack HCI all about. Well, it's a new purpose-built HCI operating system from Microsoft, which is delivered as an Azure service, right? I want to underline that. It's delivered today as an Azure service. It's an operating system, which is delivered as an Azure service. Now, firstly, it remains an enterprise class software-defined hyper-conversion hyper infrastructure, which runs Hyper-V, storage spaces direct, or um, and Azure-inspired networking. Now, some of the features, uh, in fact, Microsoft introduced a new feature with, uh, with the Azure Stack HCI, which uh, customers have been clamoring for for quite some time now, is the new feature known as the stretch clustering for disaster recovery. So which means the Azure Stack HCI has a native uh, you know, disaster recovery solution through Azure Stack HCI stretch clustering. So 
which has the capability today to provide an automatic failover to restore production workloads quickly without the need for the manual intervention. That's pretty cool. Now, you can choose uh, between a synchronous um, uh, you know, uh, replication method or an asynchronous replication method, depending on the bandwidth availability between the two sites. So uh, like I mentioned, Azure Stack is an operating system that is delivered as an Azure service today. So naturally, it's born hybrid with absolute deep integration into Azure. Now, Azure Stack at CI has its own resource provider, so much so that when you actually um, you know, configure your Azure Stack at CI, create a cluster, the next step that you're supposed to do is to register your cluster with an Azure subscription. So when you, when you do that, it shows up as a resource in public Azure. So you can manage that resource just like you would manage any other resource. Now, uh, so with that comes the Azure as a discrete resource that you can manage with the Azure control plane. That's pretty cool. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with Azure Resource Manager, uh, it's also known as ARM. This is what, this is actually the secret sauce behind this. This is what makes the single, single control plane, which is the Azure control plane, to manage and monitor your distributed workloads. So uh, what does that mean, right? So what it means is actually you can manage an Azure Stack at CI either within the Azure Stack portal, or if you're familiar with the programming stuff like the Azure CLI, a PowerShell or REST APIs, you can do that as well. So the best part is you can apply the Azure governance constructs, such as if you're familiar with Azure Tax or um, access controls and governance policies, to your on-premises resources. Isn't that cool? Now, all of this, like I said, the secret sauce to make this happen, to make this magic happen, is nothing but the Azure ARM, uh, which is nothing but Azure Resource Manager, uh, which is again managed by the Azure ARC service. So I'm gonna talk about, spend a little bit of time uh, doing some live demo on Azure ARC and what, what are some of the capabilities that it can bring in. So um, the best part about the, the new Azure Stack solution is, is uh, this is not something that is DIY, which means customers today cannot stitch it themselves. So Microsoft partnered with a number of hardware partners, which obviously Dell, uh, Dell EMC is a leading partner, um, to actually certify these solutions um, as a, as a as basically a, a tailor-made solution for a purpose-built hardware, specifically designed to run Azure Stack HCI operating system. Now, because it is delivered as an operating system, the solution is always going to be kept up to date um, with the annual feature updates and monthly quality updates and security updates and you name it. So it's, it's also easier to integrate. In fact, uh, Microsoft recently, um, uh, when they went the digital event, they announced newer capabilities. And also, uh, uh, as recently as the Microsoft build in 2021, they come up, they came up with new capabilities, which I'm going to talk about in Azure Arc. So, uh, you know, uh, that's the intent. The intent is to, you know, deliver these capabilities and services literally over the air. And um, so, not only is Microsoft you know, um, pulling customers into in the into the cloud native era, but they're also uh, you know uh, they're also sensitive about the customers' existing assets and skill sets. So Microsoft is committed to ensuring that the IT professionals can use their existing skill sets and familiar tooling when managing these diverse platforms. So uh, you know, customers can leverage. Um, you know, uh, the existing knowledge of the traditional virtualization, which they already have, or, uh, or storage solutions, which they're already comfortable with. Uh, they can do that today uh, using the same management software, uh, like System Center, for instance, Windows Admin Center. I'm going to talk about Windows Admin Center. So that's the management tool for managing HCI clusters. Um, and PowerShell, right? So they don't have to feel uh, out of place just because you know um, it's bringing the Azure integration into the into the picture. So, really, the, for customers, they're getting the best of both worlds, which means the on-premises traditional environment, which they're accustomed to, and also the cloud-native um, you know um, features and capabilities that Azure brings in. And of course, you are going to need. So, if you have to do all of this um, at this kind of a magic, 
you are going to need a hardware which is software and server services solution provider to optimize the overall uh, a solution and simplify this experience right that that's critical to this so i'm going to show how dell has made this management experience on the azure stack at ci a sheer magic because there is a uh, seamless integration like you know I'll let me talk less and probably show you more all right so uh, if you look at why uh, you know dell in particular for azure stack at ci so we we command close to about 77 person market share in the azure stack family itself and that's with the reason uh, we have partnered with microsoft for the last 3 decades um if you look at unlike uh, our approach towards building this solution has been slightly different compared to the competition now unlike the competition that relies heavily on reference architecture now dell has adopted uh, a productized approach so what does productized approach really mean so with the dell emc's integrated uh, system for microsoft azure stack at ci it's an all in one productized at ci solution which is delivered to the customer which is flexible factory ready nodes which go with it uh, which makes the overall deployment and the management experience for the customers absolutely seamless now with the fully productized approach that we go with it ensures that customers end to an experience with the solution uh, as seamless as possible uh, you name it for example uh, choosing the perfect configuration or it could be uh, the virtualization hosts and the network switches or uh, when it comes to ordering deployment uh, management and maintenance support you name it we pretty much have everything covered from an end to end perspective because today we have a we have a saying at dell you know we want customers to look up the stack and not down the stack and that that philosophy holds true with the solution absolutely because we do not want customers to be really uh, driving it as a business but rather than concentrate on their business goals than worrying about the it uh, business so uh, and we have a broad portfolio of hci nodes today from the smallest uh, you can name it for the smallest uh, remote branch offices to the most demanding intensive data uh, database workloads uh, in the core data centers and these solutions are intelligently and deliberately configured with a wide range of component options to meet the requirements of uh, nearly you can name it any use case that that we have come across and because we have adopted again the productized approach right uh, it gives us a lot of uh, leeway into the way we design these products which means each chassis you uh, for instance drives processors or memory modules or network adapters or even the bios firmware driver versions in fact all of these have been carefully selected and tested by dell engineering engineering teams so that customers have a seamless experience so um, you know uh, dell Te technologies um, you know engineering team is to uh, the intent of it is to optimize the performance and the resili resiliency of this infrastructure that's why you're seeing it is designed for 69s actually in fact uh, we have dedicated so much time into designing this environment so it to be absolutely uh, you know fault tolerant uh, this is why we were able to claim the 69s uh, uh, badge on the azure stack at ci solution and not just that all of this is backed by the team of uh, you know specially trained technical support team be it deployment consulting services professional services you name it so you, you know whenever you know we are ready to accelerate the time to value so when customers orders there is very very little time before they are actually up and running on premises on the azure stack infrastructure and the uh, and the most exciting part right is is the way we do life cycle management capability so um, you know i'm not going to talk about that i'm just going to show you how it is done right um, all right so uh, without taking much time so i will quickly jump into the demo so as you can see i have a um, rdp session right into one of the azure stack hci clusters um this is uh, windows admin center uh, which actually manages the azure stack at ci clusters now if you look at uh, the dashboard it, it pretty much gives me the snippet of what's going on with the overall system so i have total of four servers so if you look at the number of servers uh, here that we have today 
uh, go into the inventory, you can see there are four nodes, which are physical nodes. Um, if you're familiar with Dell, uh, they are actually Dell AX740 XTs. So we have configured a cluster out of these four nodes. Uh, this is an HCI cluster based out of software defined. Um, and um, you know, this is one of one of the things that I want to show you. So this is this is something what Microsoft did is they exposed uh, through the SDK. They allowed third party uh, vendors like uh, the, you know hardware partners like uh, Dell EMC to develop and integrate the hardware capabilities seamlessly into the Windows Admin Center. And if you look at the Dell EMC Open Manage integration. Now, I don't have to open a different console. It's actually available well within the Windows um, Admin Center uh, itself. So how do I do that? If you, I just go into settings, if I go into extensions, now, uh, since it's already installed, so it's not available for installation. If you look at already installed extensions, it says Dell EMC Open Manage integration. So. Just like Dell, uh, you know, Microsoft has enabled other hardware partners to build these capabilities uh, so that they can seamlessly integrate. But we have gone a step ahead. Um, I'm sure I'm going to show you how. So um, if I go into the cluster manager, all right, um, click on the Dell EMC Open Manage integration. So as you can see, we have this as the logo. It has uh, this badge saying Azure Stack at CI certified. Uh, it shows up, there are four nodes that are coming up. And if I just click on the inventory, uh, probably go into one of the nodes. So it pulls up pretty much all the information about that server. Say for instance, if I had go into the firmware, I need, uh, if I want to check what is, what is the firmware on my backplane, right? It has all that information and this is pulled up at runtime. So only when I click it, it actually shows up. Right? So it basically shows me pretty much complete insight of all the hardware components that are part of this server. Now, one of the great things uh, that we do here is the uh, automated lifecycle management. So uh, what is automated lifecycle management? So uh, think about it, right? So you customers today have to update their uh, Azure Stack HCI, like I mentioned, it's gonna be available over the air. Um, they're going to, Microsoft will keep pushing security updates, um, or uh, um, or feature updates, so that has to be updated. In addition to that, Dell is also going to push hardware and firmware updates. That also has to be updated. So we are talking about two different uh, things here. One is the hardware update and the software update. And the best part is both of them have to be updated uh, at a single click. And we are the only ones in the industry today uh, to actually make this magic happen. So which means today with our capabilities, um, maybe I can quickly show you uh, during the interactive demo. If you can see here, the way we, uh, this way is something that we do uh, when we create the clusters itself. So um, if you just click on, so this is by the way, Windows Admin Center. So where we actually discover these servers automatically. Okay, so right now it's, as you can see, it is actually discovering the servers under that particular domain. Uh, it automatically found that there are, there are about four servers. Now, if I click on next uh, with the Azure Stack HCI operating system installed, um, and it checks whether their domain joined because one of the primary requisites is it has to be part of the domain. Um, and it will automatically require the install and install the uh, uh, updates that is required for the HCI operating system. So as you can see, there are particular features that needs to be enabled as well. Data duplication, Hyper-V features that needs to be installed. BitLocker drive encryption. So these are some of the features that is automatically installed as part of the uh, uh, cluster creation. So um, if you look at it, so now it is going to check for the OS update if it's available. If it is available, it is going to automatically install that, right? So as you can see, it's, it's, it's installing that. All right, so it's successfully installed. Now comes, now, so now you're, HCI operating is system is completely up to date. Now, what about the Dell hardware and firmware? Are they up to date? Don't know. So that's something that we need to check. So how do we do that? It's in the same workflow. So I don't have to open a Dell console for that. Now, all I need to do is just click on, you know, get updates. 
right? It automatically picks up, gets into the plugin. So this is a plugin that we are able to build with Microsoft. So this is a co-engineering effort that we did with Microsoft. So um, if you look at the uh, summary of the hardware and scroll, scroll down, right? It shows what are some of the updates that are available, right? Uh, and what is the update source? So where do I update this from? Or where did this pull this information? This information where it said there are some updates available is actually pulled from an online catalog. Now, if customers are not comfortable pulling it from online catalog, they can store it locally in the share. Uh, they can do a create their own uh, catalog using Dell Repository Manager, for instance. So for now, I'm going to use the online catalog update. So as you can see, um, you know there are a number of things which says which are not compliant. Right. So again, I want to stress this. Right. We have not even gone into the management part of yet. We're still creating a cluster. So even when we are creating the cluster, we're actually checking each of these hardware components and the software components are up to date. So that's that's pretty cool, isn't it? So um, and then you click on update, and uh, you know it will automatically go ahead and update. Now before I uh, you know talk about this update, so. When it actually runs an update, right? So when you click this button, you're pretty much done. You're handing over the entire show uh, to this to this to the code. So what it does, it programmatically drains each of the nodes one node at a time, so that every node is rebooted just once. So when I say draining of the nodes, there may be workloads which is running. Well, for this particular uh, you know feature uh, for this particular workflow since it's a new cluster that we are trying to create uh, there is obviously not going to be a workload but think about let's say you're doing it over a period of time maybe uh, you have already deployed the cluster and tomorrow you want to run the same operation again so during that time there can be production watch workloads which which is uh, already running so you need to drain those nodes before you reboot them all of this draining of the nodes um, uh, updating the firmware, updating the software, which is the operating system software, and rebooting the server, getting it back up, and then uh, adding it back to the cluster, identifying the next node, moving the workload back, draining the node, all of this is done automatically, right? Isn't this cool? So this is something we are the only ones in the industry who can do this, uh, who can make this happen today. All right, so that's pretty much about, uh, I had to show about the integration, uh, the Dell Open Manage integration with uh, the Windows Admin Center. Now, I'm gonna spend a little time talking about uh, Azure Arc. Now, if you look at uh, Azure Arc today, um, sorry, oops. Sorry. All right. So if you uh, if you look at uh, Azure Arc today, so what is Azure Arc? Now, Azure Arc enables you to manage non-Azure resources. For example, uh, it could be a Kubernetes cluster, or it could be a SQL server, or it could be a bare metal server which is deployed on premises. But you want to manage all of these uh, distributed resources, like I spoke about, from an Azure control plane. So you can literally onboard all of these uh, distributed resources to Azure. Now, how does it do? So if you look at uh, um, you know, um, Azure Arc today, so let me just quickly go into Azure Arc. So click on Add Infrastructure. If you look at the some of the services in Azure Arc, you can add your servers. Now, the servers can be bare metal servers or a virtual machine that's deployed in any hypervisor of your choice or a virtual machine which could be deployed in AWS or GCP. Now, all of this can be managed from an Azure control plane, right? It's as simple as just creating, uh, generating a script. Once the script is generated, you're going to run that script in the server that you want to onboard to Azure control plane. Um, and it installs an Azure Arc agent and it starts showing up um, in Azure Arc. So I'm going to show you one. I've already done this. I'm going to do it in this demo. Um, I've already done this. So I'm going to show you how that is done. Now, uh, if you look at uh, what are the other capabilities that Azure Arc has, has, is you can also onboard your Kubernetes clusters. For example, um, you already hosted a Kubernetes clusters in your in your environment. Now you can onboard all of that Kubernetes clusters, irrespective of whether it's an Azure Kubernetes service or a CNCF compliant, um, you know, Azure a Kubernetes cluster. Right? It does not matter. So if it is Azure Kubernetes service, 
you don't have to deploy an Azure Arc agent. Remember, I told you you have to install an Azure Arc agent if you have to onboard that into Azure Control Plane. But in case of an Azure um, uh, Kubernetes clusters, the moment you create an Azure Kubernetes clusters, it will automatically show up in the Azure Control Plane yeah, with Azure Arc. So uh, if it is non um, AKS clusters, um, any CNCF compliant uh, Kubernetes clusters can be onboarded. The only additional step that you would need is to push those agents into those Kubernetes clusters. So um, coming back again, so uh, going back to Azure Arc. So, uh, so these are some of the things that you can do. So uh, servers and Kubernetes clusters, which are running on premises can be onboarded. I'll tell you the use case later. Now um, that's the cool part of it, right? Now, uh, there is something known as the, uh, the Azure services. There are two types of services. One is the data services. The other one is the Azure um, Arc enabled application services. Now data services, for instance, SQL managed instance. So um, if you look at what is, uh, so by, um, in fact, uh, uh, last week when Microsoft went the did the digital event, um, the uh, SQL managed instance is going to be generally available. Right now, if you see it's, it shows preview, but it's going to be generally available on July 30th. So what are the benefits of, uh, you know, uh, installing something known as uh, something like uh, SQL managed instance using, uh, using Azure Arc. So you're going to get cloud benefits, for example, elastic scale or a built-in automation. You can scale up or down or scale out depending on your use case. And the best part is you can, uh, you can tie it up to your cloud billing model, right? Um, it's an evergreen SQL, which means it has a continuous release over the air update. So you don't have to worry about, oh my God, this is going to go end of life very soon. Right, um, and um, it, the best part is your routine DBA tasks can be completely automated. For take for instance, high availability tasks or backup, for instance, all the DBA tasks can is completely automated and happens behind the scenes without your knowledge. Um, why does somebody want to host a SQL managed instance on an Azure Kubernetes cluster, which is deployed on Azure Stack Hub? Think about it, right? So uh, customers who are looking at um, you know, high performance and low latency database requirement, right? Uh, they want their database to be running on premises instead of probably running in Azure or any cloud because they can solve, um, you know, um, low latency kind of uh, use cases, right? And, and a single pane of glass, right? Across all the deployments of data workloads, it could be wherever it is running, I can pretty much manage all of this from an Azure control plane. Now. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to quickly go into the servers. If you look at, uh, I told you I've already onboarded a virtual machine, which is actually running here. If you go into my virtual machine, okay. So that particular virtual machine, if you see Windows 2008 Arc VM, it's actually deployed on my Azure Stack at CI cluster. It's something that I've onboarded here. It says Windows Arc VM. The best part is now, it will work just like an Azure VM. So that means I can apply Azure governance constructs, say for instance, tagging or access control policies. I can diagnose and um, you know, solve problems or I can integrate with Azure Security Center, right? And the best part is I can have update management, which means I can make sure that all my assets, which is spread across the, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, geographical locations, or um, you know, um, uh, on a different environments. All of this can be managed within the Azure Control Plane. Isn't that beautiful? So, which means I can make every server absolutely consistent with one another, right? Uh, just likewise, I've also onboarded a Kubernetes clusters, uh, which is TME cl uh, clusters, which I've onboarded here. Now, I'm going to show you how you can actually deploy a SQL managed instance onto a Kubernetes clusters on um, uh, running on Azure Stack at CI. So all you need to do is just say create. Um, it picks up an Azure subscription. And let's say I pick up uh, a resource group and just enter test three. Okay, the most important thing is the custom location. If you look at custom location, it says choose the custom location associated with ARC enabled Kubernetes clusters where you want a data controller to be deployed. So what it does is basically before you actually deploy 
a, a SQL managed instance onto an Azure um, onto Azure Stack HCI um, AKS clusters. Uh, you are supposed to create a data controller. Right, and the data controller is going to reside on the HCI clusters. Um, it could be HCI clusters, or it could be any CNCF compliant uh, Kubernetes clusters. Right now, you can deploy your SQL instance just like that. So this is where the custom location comes into the picture. So in my custom location, I've already deployed. Um, you know, I've already created a custom location. It's called TMB custom location. So I'm not going to create this, but I'm just going to show you. But because I have already deployed a SQL managed instance. So this is the first DB is a SQL managed instance, which is already deployed, right? Now, isn't this cool, right? So where you are, you're really making, uh, you know, uh, completely distributed computing, uh, um, like Satya Nadella calls it as ubiquitous computing um, in managing from an Azure control plane. That's the magic of Azure Arc. And with that, I'm going to come to the end of the presentation. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, really appreciate all the live demos. It help, helps things come alive there. So um, we're, we're a little bit past time. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll bring all the other speakers in as well, because uh, I think the questions that I have to ask you can be uh, of interest to everybody. So. Um, as a group, what do we think the future is? So do, do we think the future is in terms of individual cloud platforms innovating and getting better and better and better, but going off in different directions? Yeah. Or uh, is it uh, cloud platforms learning to live with one another and coming together and the kind of thing that we've just seen where each vendor supporting the, the other's workflows and so on? So um, anybody want to pick up that one? Yeah, I think I've got some thoughts on that. I think. For us Good. at Liberty, AWS is great, but not every tool is right for the job. Um, like Michael covered at the start, uh, you're not going to be able to do a lot of that sort of high performance computing. Um, that's maybe dealing with particle data, um, with very specific hardware requirements in all the clouds. I think sort of hybrid cloud approach does does lean towards the future. Um, although obviously that hybrid cloud approach does come with sort of downsides in terms of you can learn to use a hammer really well. But if you're using five different tools, you're not going to be as proficient across all of those. So I think is that there's an air of caution around a higher cloud approach, but it definitely isn't one tool that fits every job, in my opinion. Cool. Any, anybody else want to hmm. have a, a swing at it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's all about partnerships now, right? It's not just, you know, um, I will walk away with what I've done. So it's all about partnering with different ecosystems and how you can deliver and uh, make the customers win at the end point. Now, today, customers are segregated. They don't want to stick to a particular technology. They want to be able to use uh, or have access to multiple technologies. At the same time, they want to be able to govern all these resources because that's, that's where it brings complexity. Cool. Very good. And then uh, another question there. So we were talking about customers there in terms of like big multinational companies. But I mean, uh, at this time of year, there's a lot of you know group new graduates uh, that they're leaving college, they're going in for their inductions at companies and so on. So what advice would you give to a new developer who's kind of completely freaked out, <laughs> you know, because they, they've seen an Azure talk, they've seen an AWS talk, you know, they, they, they've they seen, you know, the, the huge amount of stuff that, that's out there at the moment. What strategy will you, would you advise them to go for? A little bit of everything, focus on one thing, where, where would be the, the best place to start? I think I'll take this one, Garth. So I only graduated this time last year, like I was only getting my marks. Um, yeah, I, I've been working with Liberty for a few years, so I've been really fortunate to be exposed to this sort of stuff, um, sort of the DevOps side of things and you know, AWS and whatnot. Um, my advice to anybody looking to get started is to pick a provider and get hands-on with building stuff. And that is exactly why I think tools like CDK Patterns is really powerful. It's not a blog post. It's you've got a full working project that you can play with and get hands on. And I think that that not just for AWS or not just for CDK is really important and can give you a real insight into how the things how things work and how things should be done. Um, cool. 
Very good. Excellent. And uh, just to finish off, anything, would one of you like to ask anything to, to any of the other presenters? Going once. Going twice. Sold. Okay. So look, we're, we're past time there. So we better uh, put a bow in the puppy and call it a day. Thank you all so much, you know, for your contributions. Yeah. And uh, thanks to uh, to everybody who's watched and supported Bash. Uh, as I say, this is us for the summer, uh, but we will be back afterwards, you know, so watch uh, Twitter and meet up for details. So uh, thank you so much indeed, everybody. Cheers. Have a great summer. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.